Hey, Mark, it's Dennis from the Australian Rock Show. How are you, mate? Hey, Dennis. I'm very well, thanks, mate. Yourself? Look, I'm not too bad. So great to finally have you on the show, and this particular show is, in fact, our 100th episode. So getting on the phone is a special way to celebrate our milestone. Now, got a whole bunch of things to cover with you on this interview. So let's start with your current activities in both Rose Tattoo and as part of the Blood, Sweat and Beers lineup. 2018 seems busier than ever for you, mate. Oh, yeah, it's been, it's been a busy year. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the main priority, of course, now is, um, um, you know, Rose Tattoo. Uh, as far, far as uh, Blood, Sweat and Beers goes, I think, you know, I, I, I put the cue on the rack on that one. Um, but, uh, yeah, the thing is, uh, we, we're off, um, let me see, this time next, well, this time next week, uh, we'll be... Um, in Germany, we'll be working in Nuremberg in Germany and start another European tour. And uh, then we go into the UK and do, uh, I think it's um, Dublin, Belfast, uh, Glasgow, Newcastle, Birmingham and London. And then we, we come back home and then start a, a, a um, 40th anniversary of the, uh, the Rock and Roll Outlaw. We're going we're gonna to do a, a tour here in Australia. Yeah, it sounds uh, it sounds pretty pretty busy, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, it's, it's great. But we, you know, that 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 tour starts on September the twenty seventh at the Corner Hotel in in Melbourne, and uh, it goes it takes in all the states. We get we we cover everyone. Yeah, it's going, it's going to be good. Uh, it's you know uh, I'm on record in a number of places over the years. Um, Rose Tattoo has been my favourite band for a long long while now, and uh, it's a it's a real pleasure to be able to play in the band. You know. Well, may I say you uh, you seem pretty content and well suited to playing in the Tats. How how did that gig come up? Well, well, I, I was you know I've, I've known the known of, you know known of the band since it's probably you know pretty close to its conception. You know, uh, uh, they were signed up to Alberts in late nineteen seventy six, I think. But uh, you know, when they should issue come back to record, let there be rock. Um, you know, we, there was a, there's been a pretty sort of solid relationship through the got you know through Phil who was um, worked with Angry and Geordie in in uh, Buster Brown and then uh, Bomb was a real fan of the band uh, of Rose Tattoo also so uh, ever since then it, it's been a, a pretty solid relationship you know um, unfortunately the, the lineup of the band then there's only you know from the very original lineup there's only Angry left unfortunately. Or fortunately, should I say? Mm. And um, yeah, it's 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 just I've followed the band's you know career for a long while. And I've always been a fan of the band, and it's uh, uh, you know I've been good mates with Angry for quite some time now. So uh, the timing was right for us, uh, and he he saw he, he saw a lineup he wanted to put together, and thankfully I was a bass player. Well, you know I've seen um, many lineups of the band over the years, and personally speaking, uh, not since. The 1998 lineup, which had Ryland, Wells, and Cox on board, have I heard the band sounding as heavy and with as much grunt as it does now? Now, tough question. How, how does that firepower, which this lineup generates, compare to what you felt on stage with, say, Heaven or dare I say, mid 70s ACDC, or is it non comparable? Well, no, you can compare everything. Um, you know, I, I don't think you can, it could, can, you can compare it to Heaven because Heaven was, wasn't that sort of band. I was more like a a real heavy, mm. heavy rock band, you know, or, or, no even version on metal, you know. But you know, uh, I, I, I think um, the comp- comparison for me is, a, is, a, is, a, is the one of the strongest is between this and ACDC. Um, there, there, there's a similar, um, there's a similar vibe to it. Uh, I think with, with with Rose Tattoo though, it's a um, more still the blues based thing, it, it, blues based boogie thing is still there, mm. very very you know prevalent. I think you know um, with the ACDC, I, I can only really comment on, on on the time I was with with the band, of course, you know with with ACDC. But they're, they're two bands, the two bands, it's a, it's a very similar feel playing on stage with them, very similar feel, yeah. Do similar you ever, vibe to it. Do you ever play some of Ian Ryland or, or Geordie Leach's bass parts and think, you know, man, that sounds good? Well, they're, they're they're great they're great parts. It's it, you know they're, they're both great bass players. You know, um, Ian Ian wasn't there for, for a heck of a long time. Mm. So most of the stuff that um, I play live is 
uh, Geordie's part. So, although there's a, there's a we are we're doing a, um, a fair bit of um, the Black Eyed Bruiser album, which is Steve King, mm. which is which is pretty good too, you know. But yeah, yeah, I've always I've always liked really um really appreciated and always always liked Geordie's playing. So it, it's it's a it's a, it's a, a they're good parts to play, man. You know, Geordie's a great bass player. He is. And now the Tats also have Bob Spencer in the current lineup, which yep. as a historian of Australian rock and roll, I find interesting. Bob, of course, left the outfit Finch in 77, shortly before you joined them. And then David Hines, who did Time and Rabbit with original ACDC frontman Dave Emmons, would join you in Finch Contraband a short time later. The yep. ACDC family tree is a tangled and fascinating one for some. But my question is really about Bob Spencer. What is Bob's playing style bring to the sound of Rose Tattoo and what's it like having him as a bandmate? Oh uh, yeah, well, well Bob, Bob was Bob, had, Bob was um, offered a gig in Rose Tattoo originally about the same time I was right back in um, uh, 1977 so I, I think Angry's had him earmarked for quite some time and, and I think he falls into the category of uh, it being the right time for him too he's always loved the band see, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, it's it's important for Bob and myself um, coming into the band uh, because we've we've known the guys in the band and been good good mates with all the guys and many of them are unfortunately aren't around anymore. Mm. Uh, there, there, there's a there's a fair bit of gravity coming in, in into the band. It's not just like joining the band. You know, it's joining Rose Tattoo. You know uh, that's one thing. But you know we're, we're continuing on what a, what a lot of our mates started off. You know, and, sure. and to me, there's a real leg- legacy and a heritage to uh, to take care of, you know, and respect. And uh, I think it shows in the band's fan base too, because sure. you know, there's uh, like you know, particularly in Europe, it's it, it's crazy over there. We we're, we're just um, we we did a we're in Europe most of June and, and then part of July, and the reaction to the band over there is just phenomenal. It's 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 bigger than it's ever been over there you know so it's uh and then we go then we get to try in the uk soon too so it's it's going to be interesting but um yeah but bob, what bob brings to band is he, he, his own his own take on you know what those good all those guitar parts primarily the guitar parts that mick invented and along with robin later on he's playing those parts and he you know he he, he digs both those guys you know playing and uh He's steeped into it, so he, he he brings his own take to it. Mm. Um, it it's uh, he he plays he plays the parts great, but he, he plays them like himself. It's as much as the way I, I do with the bass. So I, I play, you know, I've studied Geordie's parts. I, I knew all Geordie's parts anyway. You know, I just from years of listening and then appreciating, I knew it all. Uh, but so yeah, but I can't play like Geordie, and uh, so there's so there's a there's a bit of a difference, and that that's. You know what happens with Bob? He's, he's playing Robin's parts and, all, and also mixed parts, but he's playing them as how he plays them. So it, 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 I think it brings a, a, a new edge to it, and it's probably probably heavier than it has been for quite some time. Mm, yeah, it's noticeable. You know, from yeah, from the crowd. yeah, well, yeah, the reaction to the band. You know, like when we've been working here in Australia, it, it's blown me out because I thought I was, you know, well, no, I wasn't ready for, for a backlash at all. But I was, I was, you know, I, was I was quite ready for it to be some. Uh, you know, wasn't a gamble to get this line up on the road, but but it, it, was, it was a real real test to see how it'd go with the old time fans of the band, and and, and it, it's it's been really accepted really really well. Very well, very pleased that it's been accepted. Yeah. Personally speaking, no one can ever fill the big shoes of Peter Wells. He's distinctive. No, no, not guitar. at all. His sound was world class. Yet Di Pritchard is pretty darn good, isn't he? Yeah, well, Di, Di is great. See, that, that that's the whole thing. Um, Di tells a story when he's talking to Pete when uh, uh, Di was, you know, when he, when he, Di landed the gig and he, 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 Pete just said to him, be yourself. You know, he, he, there was a lot of, there was a couple of other guys that were around that were basically clones of Peter that knew Peter stuff backwards. But that's what Peter and Angry didn't want for the band. They didn't want to get a Pete clone. They wanted it to someone who was going to bring something a bit different to the band. But, Will honour all, all the all the parts, you know. He dies a very different player from Pete, but mm, mm. you know it, it's it's you know when dies playing, it's always sounded like Rose Tattoo to me. Well, I know that um, 
I, along with many other fans, always speak highly of Pete's slide guitar work. Yet, interestingly enough, your longtime musical partner, Dave Tice, has said that Pete was, in fact, the best bass player he ever worked with. So there you go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Pete, Pete was a fantastic bass player. He could play sax, too, which I only just found out recently. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. But, uh, yeah, you know, Pete was, I, I, Pete's bass playing, playing was, um, was incredibly busy and heavy. But, gee, what a great bass player. Very inventive, very different. Well, it's been uh, some time since the Tats released Blood Brothers 2007 from memory. If things yep. keep moving forward, has Angry mentioned, or are there any plans to possibly write new material and head into the studio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 there's, there's plans afoot. You know, it, it, it's a, a bit early for, for me to be um, speaking about it because, you know, it's really, really, you know, um, well, I'm a member of Rose Tattoo. It's not my, my um, place to really sort of to say well, what the plans are at this stage. But all I can tell you is that, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to the future and uh, we're looking to um, do some really interesting things in the next 12 months. Stay it's, tuned. It's going to be good. It's good stuff. And as you mentioned before, uh, very shortly, the band are back in Europe for another run of shows there, including some dates with Girl School, which I personally love to be at. How have you found the European audiences and were you prepared for that level of adulation of fan worship, which the band oh, had in Germany? I, I knew I knew from um, being in Europe um, uh, uh, quite a bit over the last few years. Um, I, I've got friends, uh, very good friends now in Berlin. I stay, you know, and uh, I stay in Berlin with them, and they're they're, they're like the number one ticket holding roast tattoo nuts, mm. you know. Mm. And you can't go to a bar, a rock and roll bar in Berlin, without seeing photos of Bon Scott and and and, and uh, angry. It's incredible. It, 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 the, uh, the, it's um, something that's it, it's quite um, revered over there. It, it, it's like the, the, the um, Bon Scott era ACDC and, and Rose Tattoo. And going back over there, doing the, the, all the club shows we did, we did over there in the last run, they all sold out to the point where they added six extra shows, which were also sold out. Um, and then we're going back, and they're, they're, they're pretty much all sold out again this time around. Um, in, in Germany, particularly, Ger- Germany and France, uh, it, it's um, it's amazing that that, uh, that the um, the appreciation is still there. It, it blew me out, you know, like the, the reaction to the bands. You, can, you go on YouTube and see some of the the, the um, songs from the German uh, club dates, and it's. Fuck, I thought I was in the Beatles. You know, <laughs> you know it, was, it was pretty incredible. Except there's no, there's no screaming girls. It's all yelling and screaming guys, of course, you know. <laughs> but that's life. <laughs> Look, uh, let's change uh, track a little. A couple of years back, I saw you with the reunited TMG. Again, you look like you were having a ball playing those tunes live. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. I, I, I seem to be, I really seem to be gravitating towards the Albert's bands, huh? Like there's TMG and the Rose Tattoo and... And uh, I, you know, I well, worked quite a, a bit with Mark Gable on different things. Yeah, it, uh, the guys in TMG, uh, they're, um, they're they're great guys, and I really in, enjoyed my, my time with them. Uh, hopefully, I, you know, I don't know how how, it, how it's placed, but you know, it, it, if the opportunity came up to revisit playing with TMG again, I'd love to do it. They're great guys there, you know, uh, Les and Gary. And Herm have been, you know, friends of um, friends of mine for a long, long time. And you know, once again, it's, it's the Albert's time. And, and with Herm, Herm and Les, they, they they used to play in a band with Malcolm Young. So it's it's all very, uh, you know, it's all very um, linked in, isn't it? It is. It is. And. Just from memory, my brother did a live review a couple of years back and stated that TMG's delivery of uh, It's a Long Way to the Top is as close as you're going to get to that vintage ACDC sound on stage. I mean, how did it feel to have Les and Gary crank out Malcolm and Angus's riffage? I, I think both Les and Gary, both way underappreciated guitar players, yeah, who never, well, who got, never yeah. get the accolades they should, in my opinion, just phenomenal. No, 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 I, 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 I'd agree with you. But, you know, both of them are, are great guitar players. And um, Gary's a great singer too. It was uh, the, the part of the TMG show that, which always went really da- down well, was um, he used to do an acoustic bit in there with Julia and Falling in Love Again, and mm-hmm. they used to work a treat, you know. But he's a great singer, Gary. But and Herm, Herm is great to play with. Once again, you, you say the Liz and Gary are underrated. Herm's incredibly underrated as a drummer. He's a great rock and roll drummer, man. 
he really drives the thing along. He always has been great, you know. Had Herm on the show recently, who has a book oh, in the really? works. Cool. Yeah, he has a book in the works, which I'm very much looking forward to reading. And yep. whilst on the subject of biographies, um, Mark, your rock and roll journey has continued to be written since the release of your book, Dirty Deeds, hit the shelves back in 2011, much yep. of which, uh, you know, could be added to an updated edition, or I guess along with stories from your time in ACDC, which didn't make it the first time. Any plans for an update on your book? Yeah, well, it, 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 it's, the publishers are uh, really keen for it to happen. Um, you know, uh, there there is a lot of stuff there already that I've written uh, I, I, I think, you know, it's probably a bit premature at the moment because uh, where, where the book actually ends, uh, the first book, the book actually ends in 2007. Mm. So there's quite, there's quite a bit of stuff that's gone on since then anyway. But, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a definitely a, it's a possibility, a definite possibility. Uh, if it was up to the publishers, they, 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 they've wanted something out for quite some time. But, uh, you know... Uh, like with the first one, you know, um, the, I had publishers after me to, to write the first book for a number of years. And I just, when the time's right, I got stuck into it. And I think it's going to be the same with, well, I, there you go. I, 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 I guess I've so, subconsciously made the made the decision there. So when, when the time's right for the second one, I'll do it, you know. I may as well hit you with a couple of ACDC questions since yeah, we're sure. there. Now, as is documented, your first week with the band in 75 was hectic. To say the least, an audition, rehearsal, uh, live shows, and then the Baby Please Don't Go countdown appearance. After that, the juggernaut just surged rapidly forward, didn't it? Well, it, it, it's, it's to, to look back, it, 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 it's always um, amazing to look back and, and, and look how fast that thing moves. Mm. Um, you know... When I when I joined the band, it was probably at, uh, towards the end of March 1975, and uh, you know we were playing to 15, 20 people in pubs. You know, I went and saw them in the station hotel on a Tuesday night after you know I, they did the first set, and the second set was basically me getting up and playing the, the whole of the high voltage album. You know, um, so they could have you know Manchester and Michael Brown could have a look at me at such and such. Um, but from then, uh, the thing moved along at an incredible rate to within, you know, six months after that, TNC, uh, TNC oh, sorry, High Voltage album sold over 100,000 copies. So it was, and back in those days, that was ridiculous numbers. Uh, it, just, it just took off. It's a, it's a strange thing, though. It's when, when you're inside something like that, moving mm. so quickly, mm. you don't really notice it all that much. You just what you do notice though is the, the amount of people turning up the shows, and uh, the crowds we just kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But the, the, the ACDC crowd back in those days, there was there was two separate crowds. There was the under 18s crowd that we used to you know, get at like the, uh, the 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 town hall and city hall sort of under 18 shows on Friday and Saturday night, which were basically screaming young teenage girls. Mm. Then, then there was the pub crowd that got into us. So there was, there was two actually, two completely diverse groups of people that liked us, you know. So it was, uh, and by the time we got back from England, the uh, the the, uh, the the like the, the teeny bopper thing had dropped out, dropped right off, and we had started becoming the band that that that, 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 that uh, would go on to be. Well, with those those early days, you had no prior band experience on that level to gauge it to gauge it against, did you? I mean, I think your previous outfit, Judd. Only gig sporadically, right? So. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, no. There was, there was a, you know, as far as you know, the bands I I played in before that were, you know, with mates around. You wouldn't even call a semi-professional. Probably mm. did like fifteen or twenty gigs with them. That, that's that's all, you know. But um, I got an armchair ride with ACDC because I could I could play okay, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, it, there wasn't any problem with that. The material, you know, wasn't wasn't a stretch either, of course. But. Um, you know, if you if you if you've got a, a bit of an idea ha- about how to play bass, and you like rock and roll and blues based rock and roll, and you 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 go into a rhythm section with Malcolm Young and F- Phil Rudd, if you can't do that job, yeah, you you, you know there's something wrong with it. You know, so you have, having playing with those two guys who just gave me an armchair armchair ride. So it was a really a really steep learning curve for me. 
But uh, particularly in, ending up in the studio, I think it was June 1975 to record TNT. You know, uh, George Young, I was lucky enough to have George Young take me under his wing too, which was, you know, what I learned off George, in, in, you know, doing the three albums I did with George is insurmountable what I learned off him. He's probably the most astute guy, you know, probably along with Malcolm, that, I, that um, I've ever met, ever met in the business. But, like, at that stage, George was still very much a senior uh, part of the, 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 the setup where, where Malcolm was looking to George. That's slowly over the years turned around, you know, uh, and then Malcolm was like the, the you know, the, the, the top of the tree, so to speak. But, um, yeah, it, 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 I'm forever grateful about what I learned from uh, being in that band. I, I was only in, in the band, obviously, for a very uh, small percentage of the, the, the time the band's been op operating. But um, I think they're a very important and very um, formative part of the band. And uh, it, was, it was just great. I, I, I look back at I look, look, look back at those times very, very fondly indeed, and always will. Now, you've attended Bonfest in Scotland a couple of times. How special is it for you to perform at a celebration like that? Oh, it's great. You know, I've been in Bond's hometown. It's, it's great. You know, it's, um, Kirimura is a beautiful little, um, beautiful little town. It's, um, it's funny, you know, we're with, you know, I've always had this idea in my head, um, we were, uh, you know, after Bond died, like, we were all getting older, right? And then, then, and Bond's like staying the same age. As all, <coughs> I've said a number mm -hmm. of times to, to people, there's almost a, sort of like this Peter Pan thing about him, you know. Sure. He doesn't not get, he doesn't get any older. And it's strangely enough, uh, the other famous um, uh, son of, of Kirimura is J M Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. So, uh, in, in the city square, or what, what passes for a very small sort of town square in Kirimura, there's, there's a, a um, there's a statue uh, in honour of J.M. Barry of, of Peter Pan. And about 150 metres down the road, there's a statue of Bond. So there's something you know, quite interesting about that. You know? Back then, you knew Bond uh, as well as anyone. What do you think he'd make of it all? I'm alluding to the festivals, statues, books, etc. Oh, I, 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 I think he'd look upon it as... Um, he'd, like, he'd, he'd like it. You know, he'd probably play it down a bit, but he'd have a big smile on his face and think that was pretty cool. Well, in your book, you wrote that Bon had said to you he'd wanted to do a solo album, Leonard Skinner kind of stuff. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Yeah, well, he was... The last two times I was with him, he was very um, very set in his ways. He wanted to do it. That would have made it... You made would have made, made for a very interesting um, band meeting with ACDC, that one, when he said he wanted to do a solo album. Um, you know, it's what he wanted to do. Whether he would have pulled it off, I really don't know. You know, um, it's just something he dearly wanted to do, but uh, it, it definitely wasn't the time to do it. You know, I, I, I he was, or he got down to the road as far as that he, he he picked a few people that he wanted to play on it, and uh, and, and had spoken to a couple of guys. Actually, a few guys, a couple of guys from Leonard Skinner that he's spoken to. They wanted to um to work on it with him. So yeah, he was he was. It was, you know, I knew Bond really well, and I, I you know, he, it was something that he, 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 he did want to do. Whether he would have got it across the line, who knows? But I, 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 I have the feeling that he would have eventually done something like that, sure. Well, I've always let my imagine, imagination run wild there. And whilst you just mentioned Skinner, as I believe Bond had developed friendships with Ronnie Van Zant and co, but can you imagine if Bond had affronted someone like I don't know, the Rossington Collins band in the early 80s, or did an album with 38 Special. Yeah, we, 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 it would have been so, so nice. And I know that um, he, uh, he also got on really well with, um, I, I don't know if I, at the moment, but it was the bass player. The ba bass player guy, was that the bass player? Was, was it Leon? Wilkinson, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 was, the, that was the guy he's probably closest to in the band, the bass player, mm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I know he would have had Leon in mind, yeah. Or oh, he did have Leon in mind, yeah. There you go. You know, it's one of those things that uh, didn't happen. Yeah. The thing that, that, that sticks in my mind that, that I, I sort of regret that um, didn't happen, I would love to hear Bon on Back in Black. That would have been something else. Of course, the Let There Be Rock album celebrated its 40th anniversary last year. You've got to have some fond memories from creating that album. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, this is purely my perspective on it, but I, I really sort of look at that now as is 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 the first real ACDC album. That that to me, that's when the band starts sounding like the band. Prior to that, there were some great albums like Dirty Deeds, with, you know, and then this TNT with some some good stuff on it too. But to me, that's you know, um, there's there's a run of three albums. There's um, Let There Be Rock, Power Rage, and Highway to Hell. And um, you know, I, I'm not involved in two of those, of course. But I, I look at those as a brace of albums, and I think I think they're as strong as three albums as, as anyone's ever you know, in, in that sort of style of music is put out. Uh, particularly, you know, my favourite album is Power Rage. I think it's just, I, I love that album. I've read that um, you and Phil had no involvement with the songwriting, but I've always wondered if you ever presented any of your ideas to the Youngs. Oh, no, we, we never you know, that we never did that. What we what we would do, though, would be pretty, um, you know... When you're in the studio and you're having a, having a jam on things, you're getting things together. Everyone's sort of throwing in ideas, and, and and I know that Phil, you know, Phil definitely influenced a number of tunes. Um, and I like to think that you know a couple of couple of ideas that I I, I remember throwing in. I I think that they were pretty. To me, they were, you know, I can see how they were embraced. So you know, um, but you know, it was it was never. Never ever going to be any more than you know, young young Scott. You know, I, I could never see anyone else, you know, breaking into that. That's just the way it was, and that was accepted. That was there, there's no there was no gripes about it. Mark, I also recall mention, you mentioning in your book that you attended the 1991 show at Donington, a concert yep. which I also um, attended. Have to agree that it was one of the coldest rock shows I've ever been to. It was. And, freezing, wasn't it? It, was, it was awful. <laughs> Mate, it, was, it, was, it was so cold. I ended up going down to the merch, and they only had, they only had um, Motley Crue sweatshirts left. I ended up uh, buying one of those. That's a, that's, that's, that has to be pretty cold cool for me to wear Motley Crue <laughs> People were lighting fires as well for memory. But yeah, yeah. Um, although ACDC were on form, you mentioned that you missed hearing Phil Rudd on drums and for mine you pen the most accurate of all statements on Phil and, and the drive he brings to the band by simply stating it was like taking Charlie Watts out of the stones yeah well, it is it is, it is that's just the way it has been for me with uh, when Phil hasn't been there uh, it's he's, to me he's intrinsic to the band's sound I, I think it's possible possibly now let, let me let me qualify this before I say this Malcolm Young is absolutely irreplaceable. No question about it, right? But I think to get someone in to do like the job like Stevie has, I think that's an easier uh, not replacement but someone to step in the job. I think it's easier to get someone to do that job than it is to to uh, do Phil's job and, and uh, from what I'm, what I'm, what I've been hearing over the last few months, I believe uh, Phil's back with them. So that that's going to be great, you know. So he, he, he's 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 a huge part of the band, and uh, he's had a bit of a rough trot, Phil. But I I, I would hope that uh, now he gets his uh, third chance with the band. I really hope he embraces it and uh, makes it stick. Bit of a personal question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want, but late last year you attended Mal's funeral service in Sydney. The mainstream press gave his passing a lot of coverage. Were you able to have a quiet moment during that time period and reflect on Malcolm and your time together? Yeah, of course. You know, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, getting back to to, to writing writing the the book Dirty Deeds, one of the, the main... The uh, main reasons to write that book is I, I, I read a lot of things over the years that, that, that there was a lot of animosity between uh, Malcolm and Angus and myself. Um, I wanted to put that to sleep. You know, I've had some run-ins with Angus, um, of course, but everyone did. I wasn't on Robinson Crusoe there. He's just, he's just an intense guy. But mm. Malcolm was, was uh, always been, uh, you know, you know, of course you, you, you admire and respect what Malcolm achieved and did, 
but uh, I've, I've always uh, really liked the guy. He was a really, uh, a really great guy, and uh, it's just an awful um, tragedy how it all finished up for him. You know, it's um, one of the things, the main things. Uh, you know, I've always missed a, 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 about. Uh, the band was was uh, not spending more time with with, with Phil and Malcolm. Uh, mm. Just um, yeah, I considered them really. You know, you know, it wasn't to work out. I also wasn't the right guy for the band, obviously. But um, you know, that's that's the thing I really missed it was the, the camaraderie we had going. It was it was very strong, and uh, I, I just I just love it. Phil's back in there, and I think he can only add to it now. I think there's there's a real um, with Phil back in there. Uh, and Brian, I think it, um, it, it it lends itself a real uh, bit of authenticity again, and, and I I would only hope that Cliff comes back on board at some stage too. Okay, and we uh, we mentioned George Young before, and of course uh, George passed away a few short weeks before Mal uh, yeah. last year. What what were the most important lessons, if you could name anything, did you learn from George and also Harry, which you've carried with you throughout your career? George, um, oh, there's, there's, there's an absolute litany of things I've learned from him. But just, just the main one is just how to play bass, how, how to stick to the groove playing bass. And and, and um, uh, I, like I said, I'll be forever sort of grateful for how he really took me under his wing and mentored me with my bass playing. You know, I, I, you know, the way it turns out, I don't play bass anything like George, of course. Mm. We're, we're mm. different styles. Where George is... The, the easiest way is you think of that that that, that sort of really straight ACDC bass playing. Well, that that's sort of that's how I play. And then George is how he plays is like um, say the bass playing on high body rock and roll, the single, or um, something or bullet to bite on. Mm, yeah, that, mm. that, that 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 that's 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 the way to tell who's playing bass on those early albums. When you watch straight and what's not, you know. But um. Yeah, and just just a great guy, just a really wise, what yeah, full of um, his um contribution to ACDC can, can never be overstated. Along with Michael Browning as a manager, George went through the Easy Beats demise with, with Harry, and that, that that just shattered them. But what what it did, it gave them the um, the nous and the wisdom and the forethought to uh, take a lot of potholes potholes out of the road for for ACDC and really, uh, you know, didn't give the band any shortcuts, but certainly made, th- you know, made it, the band very aware what and what not to do, you know. We mentioned the uh, the tangled ACDC family tree before, but the Rose Tattoo linkage is just as intertwined and interesting. Case in point, as we mentioned, you replaced Mick Cox in Heaven in 1984 on Rhythm Guitar. How do you look back on that time period of your career? I know you started your career on guitar, but stepping in for the fastest right hand in rock and roll, no mean feat there. Yeah, yeah, no, it was great. That was it was a it was a stra- it was a strange time because you know, um, you know, I've, I've no problem playing guitar. As you probably know, I spent the last best part of like twenty years playing guitar with Dave Tyson, the acoustic thing, you know. Mm-hmm. So, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had, uh, you know, when I was first asked about it to, to replace Mick, I had real misgivings about it, you know. It, it took a while for me to, to make that decision, you know. It wasn't until Mick, Mick came back from overseas and I spoke to him about it. He said, well, yeah, go for it, you know. So, uh, so and then, then the, the position came up where uh, the drummer from heaven, Joe, who wasn't the original drummer, he's one, one of a lot of drummers, in, in, in different lineups, um, and then uh, Robin Riley had, had, had left the band I had with together with John Layla called the Beast. Robin had left that band to go over to join Rose Tattoo. So JL and John Layla and myself were looking for something to do. So we we sort of fitted the bill there. So that we that, that was that was an interesting experience, you know. But um, yeah, that, that was um, that was good. There was there was a bit of a hard band to work with. There was some very uh, uh, individual sort of uh, individual thinking going on there in that band with 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 Kelly and Alan. They were both uh, both um, unusual guys, but both really you know nice guys. But uh, they had uh, their funny ways about them. Let me tell you. 
And I believe um, Gene Simmons from KISS, who Heaven did some supports with, and of course, who ACDC had supported back in the 70s, had showed some interest in producing Heavy, Heaven, didn't he? And I guess yeah, it would yeah. Come well, out- we did, we did, a, we did a, uh, a support run with, with um, KISS. Mm. And uh, he was, he was, he wanted, he was, he wanted to um, produce the band. He had, he wanted to try and break the band out of our recording deal, and sign us up. He wanted to, you know, do the whole thing. But um, yeah, I, I don't know how, how he's gone producing records before or since then. But you know, it wasn't to be. But he, he was, he was a great guy. He had his stuff together. But he was a, uh, a. Um, <laughs> He's a bit like a cartoon character, you know what I mean? Mate, as a side note, over the years, I was hoping Coxie, Mick Cox, could have one day released a solo album, uh, which wasn't to be, but I reckon it would have been something pretty special. Did he, he ever express his desire to do a solo record with you? Yeah, uh, no, it wouldn't have been a, a, a solo. He was always, you know, he was... He was always writing stuff, you know. But mm-hmm. yeah, he, we, you know, we, I, I played with him in, in a, the hand on us for for quite a while, and I, I think, you know, mix, you know, once he'd been in Rose Tattoo, I think that was mix always at, at mix hard. That that was at mm-hmm. the, the center of his core. You know, I think he's he, he always saw himself whether it be in Rose Tattoo or out of Rose Tattoo, and and he was out in and out quite a number of times. Um, you know, uh, I, I think he always, always saw him, himself as, as, as being in Rose Tattoo. Um, I think that was that that was at the centre of his core. He even got to a stage where um, Guns N' Roses put the feelers out for him to to, to go over and do a, do a tour with them when when Izzy left. And um, I think he, they were interested in Wells as well, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. some some stage. Yeah, but yeah, but there was, it was Mick they were after first. Mm. Mm. And uh, Mick, you know, uh, I suppose it's okay to say it now. He, he just said well, the reason he he didn't do it is because he said it wouldn't have been good for his health. <laughs> that's, sure. that's just that's pure sure. and simple. God bless him, you know. That was it. You know, he said yeah, it wouldn't have uh, been a wise choice. Look, let's change topic a bit and look at your Brothers in Arms album from 2011 with uh, Dave Tice. The title track I've always thought is stunning. The vivid imagery of eternity. The Stones cover Love in, in Vain. It's a really sort of offering that people, more people need to hear. Yeah, oh, but we, you know, Dave and myself both really enjoyed the time we had together. You know, it was quite, we had, you know, we did, we, we've kicked ourselves now that we didn't actually record more. Mm. Um, we should have recorded, because we did a number of live things that worked quite well for us. But, uh, you know, that was, you know, we should have gone back in the studio and done another one pretty soon after that one, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, working with Dave was great because you know, like, I think in, in the acoustic setting, it really showed his voice off too. You know, were there any plans to record Pete's between the saddle and the ground, which I know you've played live? I, I, I think we, the, if we were going to do a, another recording, I think we, we possibly would have done something like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> And I guess if folks listening in wish to hear Brothers in Arms, you can uh, still buy it from places like Amazon and iTunes, which I strongly recommend you do after listening yeah, to the oh, show. Yeah, no, it's a great. Well, we had a great time recording that. You know, it's only like a like a mini album. From there you go. From memory, then I think there's, there's only there's only about five or six tracks on it. I think. I it, think. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it, it, it's um. Yeah, no, we really enjoyed recording it, and and uh, working with Dave was a blast. You know. Well, out of curiosity, did you ever see Buffalo Live before you joined ACDC? No, I didn't. I, I, okay. I didn't um, didn't see them at all. I wasn't all that aware of them. Um, I remember a mate of mine had had a a, a, a Buffalo single, and it had, I think it had something on the B side of it called "Rock Down to the Barber Shop" or something. Yeah, and so I, I didn't I didn't really sort of know know of them at all. But, uh, yeah, I've, 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 no, I never, no, I never saw them play live. Mark, we should probably wind this up. And as we've mentioned, the touring schedule with the Tats looks like it's going to keep you busy well into 2019. You've mentioned yeah, yeah, oh, possibly yeah, we've we got a lot of things happening in 2019. We've got a Monsters of Rock uh, cruise over in the Caribbean. We've got uh, Wacken uh, in, in, in Germany. Um, but, yeah, so there's a lot of other tours around that. And we, we start back here in Australia um, on Grand Final Eve in Melbourne 
at uh, the Corner Hotel. So we're going to have some fun, man. You might, be bit, might better make sure you get your ass on to a gig. <laughs> I will, most definitely. You don't need to comment on here there, but uh, I've always thought wishful thinking on my part, but I reckon if you, Angry and Phil Rudd, were in the ACDC lineup along with Angus and Stevie, that lineup would blow the roof off many of the world's <laughs> largest stadiums. Never thought of that. <laughs> that'd, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Um, I'll, edit, I'll edit that one out. <laughs> no, that's fine. You, you, you can leave it there. I've got, I've got no issue with that whatsoever, man. That's fine. Well, as we mentioned, there are recent photos from the studio in Vancouver, and if they are to be believed, it would seem that we are going to get a new recorded product from ACDC. If you had a serious and sincere offer to fill Cliff's base spot, the guy who filled your shoes all those years ago, would you accept? Uh, well, I'll give you my stock answer on that, which I've used for many, many years. In the hypothetical situation, if I was asked to join... ACDC again, I would, but I'd do it on one condition. If What's Bond that? did it, I'll do it. That's a very good answer. That's the way it is. Mark, there's so much we didn't get to today, including your time with bands um, I'd seen you with, like the Party Boys and Headhunters. But let me close out by saying that uh, my brother and I have seen you many, many times over the years and personally speaking. I think it's great that in the past few years, your contribution and indeed legacy to ACDC has been acknowledged by fans throughout the world and appreciation which continues to this day and something which is well deserved. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much, Dennis. I appreciate the thought and... Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy that uh, right now as a kid at Christmas, everything's going great, and uh, to be part of Rose Tattoo is, is, is uh, it's, you know, I, you know, if the Beatles asked me to go join them, I'd say no. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the the, the, the Tattoo are my favourite band, and uh, I'm, a, you know, I, I've got a feeling I'm exactly where I should be right now. Before you go, every guest on our show gets to choose a song by an Australian band, something which is significant to them. What would you like to choose and why? Oh, you got me there. Um, that's a tough one. There's so many good ones, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, go, I'll go way back. I'll go back to this stuff that, that really sort of got me going when I was a kid. Uh, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, going to see bands in, uh, bands in Melbourne. And that's to be lovely Lloyd and the Covered Balls with Liberate Rock. Fantastic choice. That's Thank a, you for your yeah. time today. Hey, my pleasure, Dennis. You take care, man.